that is so yeah manisha please So uh, I'll be speaking on systemic therapy for uveitis. What comprehensive ophthalmologists need to know. The rationale for systemic therapy is that eye diseases are among the most feared health conditions, and a survey has shown that 60 percent people consider blindness as bad as death. Uveitis, is, as you all know, is a potentially sight-threatening disease, and it can occur due to infection or autoimmune etiology. And the treatment of uveitis is evolving with newer drugs and innovative advances. So my talk basically would be covering the rationale for selecting systemic therapy for uveitis, the use of systemic steroids as the first-line therapy, the use of immunosuppressive therapy, and what are the newer systemic drugs that we have in our armamentarium. Once you have ruled out infection or malignancy, as I showed in my previous case, ocular inflammation is the principal cause of complication in most of the patients. and the control of inflammation is the primary goal and we have to do it like a fire fighting to control the ocular inflammation which can be very destructive we have to choose approaches which have early control of inflammation with minimal side effects now coming to systemic therapy in uveitis per se we have it in two phases one is the induction phase and one is the suppression the induction phase is the initial phase of control of active inflammation and it is applicable to all the cases and we have to do it as quickly as possible while suppression is only applicable to the cases which have a chronic inflammation where long term suppressive therapy is the key to long term success and good outcomes the advantages of systemic therapy is it's easily administered highly effective easily titrated to achieve a chronic therapy goal and fewer local side effects than depo injections the disadvantages are that of course it is associated with systemic side effects and the cost of therapy sometimes can be unaffordable now what are the systemic therapies or systemic medications which are available for managing uveitis we can have nsaids we can have corticosteroids and we can have immunosuppressive agents which again we have various groups like anti, anti metabolites the t cell inhibitors the alkylating agents and the monoclonal antibodies which are commonly known as biologics As far as the systemic NSAIDs are concerned, well, they are very commonly used for scleritis cases, and they are found to be effective in one third cases. Its prevention for recurrence of anterior uveitis they can sometimes be used. However, they do not have value for induction treatment of uveitis. They may be more toxic than previously thought, and therefore, uh, you know, they have a limited role in the management of uveitis. and relative contraindications we all realize peptic ulcer disease gi intolerance renal insufficiency bleeding disorders these are all uh, indications or contraindications for the use of non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs now i think the most important systemic uh, medication that we use for uveitis are the systemic corticosteroids these are the first line of therapy in patients with non infectious ocular inflammatory diseases they are inexpensive they are potent and they act very fast these corticosteroids they bind to the glucocorticoid receptors in the cytoplasm and they have a change they bring about a change in the cellular response and thereby controlling the inflammation so they are said to have anti inflammatory and immunosuppressive effects they sequester lymphocytes to the bone marrow they are inhibiting a lot of cell responses and therefore the cell mediated immunity it is altered it stabilizes the intracellular lysosomal membranes also reducing the neutrophil degranulation so the indications are chronic bilateral diseases beyond the anterior segment scleritis that has failed to respond to nsaids severe inflammation that is too painful or destructive for allowing the initial therapy to fail the eye diseases associated with systemic diseases for which systemic steroids are indicated and also supplementing the topical therapy the relative contraindications to systemic steroids would be diseases which are likely to be exasperated by steroids such as diabetes hypertension or psychiatric problems and in ocular we can have a contraindication in the form of pre existing cscr in children relatively contraindicated as they hamper growth and therefore a low dose maintenance therapy can be used but it needs a very close monitoring the preparations of steroids are multiple which are available but prednisolone is the most common form of steroid which is often used we can also have intravenous uh, you know use of systemic steroids which is known as the pulse therapy and it is very often given in the dose of 1 gram per day for 3 days 
found to be very useful in etiologies like VKH. It is also used when oral steroids fail to achieve acquiescence of ocular inflammation. It's also used for vision threatening macular lesions and also in those situations where we need a rapid control of inflammation. So these are the guidelines to use a systemic steroids. Maybe you can take a pick of this where we start with one milligram per kg per day, often in the dose of 60 to 80 milligrams per day. And then a tapering schedule is used. Oral corticosteroids are often supplemented with calcium and with vitamin D. And this is something we have to keep in mind because there is always a risk of osteoporosis. So the induction phase is where you're going to be using a full dose of the systemic steroids in the dose of one milligram per kg and then you're going to gradually taper it. We are going to add immunosuppressive therapy if there is going to be no response after having started the corticosteroids for about two weeks to one month. And the tapering, of course, we are all very well aware of. When there's a reactivation, we may need to again step up the dose of the corticosteroids. The long-term corticosteroids is, of course, an option for severe diseases, that is the chronic inflammatory diseases. And we have to add immunosuppressive agents for steroid sparing effect if the suppressive dose is 7.5 to 10 milligram per day or is above the threshold of the tolerability. There is a whole gamut of systemic uh, side effects of corticosteroids which have to be very much kept in mind. And the most important being osteoporosis, ischemic necrosis of the femur, hypertension, hyperglycemia and weight gain. The oral corticosteroids, of course, are contraindicated in children, and they can, of course, be used for a short-term purpose for the induction phase, but we very quickly shift them to immunosuppressants, which are far safer in children because they are not going to hamper the growth of the children. And this is just one of my patients, which has a huge choroidal TB granuloma, and the patient, of course, was treated with intravitreal uh, injections of avastin and moxifloxacin, which we are now doing very often, along with systemic ATT and corticosteroids. Uh, but this patient had a paradoxical reaction, as you find over here, with the appearance of a new lesion. And this apparently required the intervention in the form of intravenous methylprednisolone and stepping up of the oral steroids. And you find that there is a complete regression of the granuloma with a recovery of 6-6-N6 vision in the left eye. Now, the steps to prevent side effects of corticosteroids is that you have to use minimal effective dose. We have to do a very close monitoring. We have to give supplements in the form of calcium and vitamin D. And once a year, DEXA bone densitometry testing is also recommended. Now, when to consider adding a steroid sparing agent is when there is going to be uh, no response and when the patient is requiring, uh, you know, a long-term steroid therapy, which is going to be more than three months, then, of course, we are going to be thinking of immunomodulatory or steroid sparing drugs. Coming to systemic immunosuppressive therapy, this will be used when there's a failure of corticosteroid therapy to control inflammation. They are going to be used as corticosteroid sparing therapy to maintain control of inflammation while averting the greater toxicity of high dose of corticosteroids. The indications, of course, are several, but the most common being like Bechet's disease, sympathetic ophthalmia, birdshot retinochoroditis, serpiginous choroditis not associated with tuberculosis, necrotizing scleritis, and of course, there are many more as mentioned by me. These are the various groups of immunosuppressants which are very commonly used in uveitis. But the basic guidelines which we all need to remember in India is that tuberculosis is very rampant and we must rule out tuberculosis or underlying HIV before putting the patient on any kind of immunomodulatory drugs. Complete blood counts and platelet counts have to be repeated every four weeks. Now, which agent to use? What are going to be the certain principles? So, most commonly, it is recommended to start with antimetabolites, anti something like a methotrexate or a mycophenolate mephitil or azothioprine. I think these are the most commonly used immunosuppressants in our clinics. Coming to alkylating agents, well, they are not very often used because of their toxic effects, though they do have a good efficacy, but they are mainly reserved for indications like vaginous granulomatosis or severe or refractory cases of uveitis requiring more than one drug. We have several biologics also, which are very commonly used, like infliximab, adalimumab, and etanoserpet. TNF-alpha inhibitors are also there, but they are less frequently used. They are used in severe cases where the conventional immunomodulatory therapy has failed. The first line therapy in selected uveitis cases like Bechet's disease, of course, they are the first line of drug. 
The challenges in India being that there's a potential risk of reactivation of latent tuberculosis and of course the cost of the treatment may be unaffordable to many of our patients. So these are the, this is the cost of the therapy of biologics, which probably is you know, not affordable to many of our patients. So five principles to remember for systemic therapy in uveitis is that you must rule out infection and malignancy as a cause of inflammation before you start the patients on steroids or immunosuppressants. We have to hit hard and hit fast in the form of induction phase with full dose of the corticosteroids to control inflammation. Maintenance with steroids or immunosuppressants is required for chronic inflammatory diseases. A regular monitoring is required for systemic side effects, which are very common with immunosuppressants and with the corticosteroids. And we must remember to shift children early to immunosuppressants because the corticosteroids, if used on a very long-term basis, can hamper the growth in these children. So thank you so much for your patient listening. Thank you, Manisha.